Welcome back to Are You a Fan, where we explore individual characters from your favorite sci-fi, action, and fantasy genres. A big thank you to Moonbound Productions for supporting today's episode. If you would like to express your support, please like and share the show. Here's your hosts, Dick Rail and Joker. Hey folks, uh, welcome to Are You a Fan? Uh, give, uh, if you like our show, if you like our content, give us a like and a follow. And uh, we're also on YouTube and Facebook, so go check us out. This week we are traveling into the lands of magic. And uh, you know what? I'm not too familiar with this area, so I'm going to let Joker take the helm and charge us, of course. So, this week we'll start with the question. If you could be... If you could use any kind of magic, like what kind of school would you use? Oh, that's a... Because, like, there's the flare of the fire and, like, the red and shit. But, um, honestly... Honestly, possibly necromancy because of the immortality or pseudo immortality. Won't right. Lie. But um, I guess, I guess also, uh, yeah, white and that like life magic and that to heal myself. That's a tough one between those three. That's a uh, cool. That's a good one. <laughs> they know you and your bard like nature. You'd, uh, I see the red. <laughs> yeah, true. You, you, you got a thing for the flare. I really do, and I do like going out in a blaze of glory. I know. Personally, I'd, I'd probably go with necromancy because something. I don't know. Maybe it's the forbidden it always has in all the different forms of media. Something about that just kind of draws me to it. And. If we're being honest, some of the forbidding of it is just kind of lame. They're just like, it's all natural. It's like, guys, we resurrect this person. We can find out who killed them. No, we won't. Die. Right, like that, you'd be the best murder investigator ever. Oh, my God. It'd be such an easy job at that point. They're like, we don't know who killed her. Back up, everybody. Let me draw a circle. <laughs> but that does bring us into the character we're talking about today, who is a master of necromancy. Liliana Vess, our first dive into the world of Magic the Gathering. Ooh, everybody tap your mana. <laughs> Let's get going. Uh, so what we got on this Liliana Vess? I know she's yeah. pretty popular. Oh, yeah. So she was born on the plain of Dominaria. So I guess real quick and a quick way to explain like the planes of existence. It's essentially like other countries or other planets. Okay. But each planet doesn't know about the other planets. The most inhabitants of the worlds know of their own plane, and that is as far as their knowledge goes. Oh, so... Was yeah, actually kind of like if there were legitimate... Uh, like, it'd be like us in our solar system if we thought Earth was the only one in the, of the nine planets. Oh, And yes, I'm okay. saying nine because I don't care what NASA says about Pluto. <laughs> Fight the power. Fight Viva the power. la Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, get behind that. But yeah, so she was born on Dominaria in the Calico Forest. Um, hmm. For her age, there as much as I try to find, there is no 100% set age for her, except for that she's an estimated to be minimum 200 years old. Minimum. And there have, because a lot of the stories, a lot of stuff in the past have aged her a little bit more than that. She's a minimum a couple hundred. Ooh, I gotta tell you, after the first hundred in that, I'd stop caring about how I, how I looked as far as clothing. The fact that she wear, still wears those fine dresses, I'm like, good on you. Well, part of that was kind of her younger life. She was a bit of a, a harlot. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, I think a lot of that is part of why she kept wearing that kind of clothing, is keep that image. Okay, fair. I can respect that <laughs> as, a, uh, as a man harlot myself. <laughs> So we'll, we'll start with the some of the early life, because each of them are kind of sectioned off into different sets over the years to make it a little easier for everyone. Mm, fair, and with the way the magic game works, probably the easiest way to delve into this. Since all the stories are based around a set somewhere in one form or another. Yep. So, she grew up in Manalia. Um, her father was a general and ruler of their lands. Ironically, for being a bit of a harlot, she was a member of a, whole, of a holy order of clerics who were known for their healing arts. Uh, she would study under a teacher named Lady Anna, um, but she also dabbled in necromancy in secret, thinking it would enhance her healing abilities. You know, like they always seem to do in stories. Yeah, which uh, 
It only cracks me up because I'm like, I'm like, guys, uh, Necromancer, I get, I guess technically is a healer who gets it's, there it's after a, it's the a late fact. healer. Yeah, like, like the clerks just gets there and is like, oh my god, it's too late for me. Necromancer just point on their gloves, like, step back, little guy. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> um, her kind of fancy lifestyle would abruptly get changed when her brother, and I'm. The issue with magic is I'm not 100% sure how anything is pronounced. Um, uh, no, no, so I'm not are. even sure about her brother's name, but I go. I usually go with uh, jo- Jasu. Um, he would suffer from a corruption by their father's enemies. As a test, Lady Anna would send Liliana um, with the task of recovering the required Essence Root to cure Jasu. She would arrive too late as the grove had already been destroyed by her father's enemies. Oh, damn. That... Well, you know, you gotta gotta have a reason for her to go uh, full ham on something. Yep. Uh, let me see if I can take this next one. Uh, uh, she would only learn of this through a mysterious man she met who claimed to be a supporter of her father. He would offer assistance and instruct Liliana to use necromancy to reactivate the trees. Remains to use for a potion. Which, you know, that's smart. She already knows a bit of necromancy, so why not? Though he would warn her that her family wouldn't want her to use this cure, she would then return with this cure. And against the warning of Lady Anna, she used it. So, F vague characters. Like, F the characters for like, do not use it. Your family will not prove Care to care to maybe mention like in like one sentence like why, like oh, necromancy? And that's kind of all it needed to be known. Yeah, which that character he is kind of a recurring character in her life, but due to how large her story is, there were some cuts, and he had smaller sections, so he was cut. But he was known as the Raven Man. Oh, and he uh- was very mysterious and would pop up out of nowhere. He's popped I, up on other planes to talk to her and kind of <laughs> attempt to persuade her into a certain direction. I mean, he's called the Raven Man. That's kind of... Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this cure uh, would cure him, but at the cost of his sanity and poisoned him again, turning him into a monster. She quickly realized she had to kill her brother and... And turned his uh, victims into zombies to fight him. It would be at this moment her spark would ignite and transport her to Innistrad. Ooh. <laughs> and to kind of explain that part. So with Planeswalkers, they're born with what's called a spark. That kind of activates their powers and their ability to travel from plane to plane. Hmm. But not quite everybody was born with one, so you know it's kind of a a feat Rip. to have it. Yeah, a bit more, a bit of a rarity. And it, I've yet to find or see a story, but it always takes a very traumatic event to spark it or to ignite it. So there's always something bad that happens that turns huh. you really into a planeswalker. I mean, I feel. I feel that's the case for most things in that. I oh, mean, yeah. I mean, this is straight up like classic, like uh, well, like classic magic stuff and new Mortal Kombat stuff. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, so we're on Innistrad. Uh, so this is the first time we're on Innistrad with her. So on her first time, while she was there, she'd perfect her necromancy skills. She would learn under vampires and liches, but fearing her brother's fate, she would refuse to join them fully in death to truly master the art. At some point during her stay on the plane, she would encounter the Lord of Innistrad, Soren Markov, who is an ancient vampire planeswalker. Um, they would duel each other, and he easily would defeat her and proceed to deem her not a threat to the planet. <laughs> he would threaten her, though, that if she was not a civil guest, he would find her and kill her. He, he is a nice host, but <laughs> he is but a very strict I, one. I, I, only two chances you get. Yes, Two. <laughs> Count it. Two. <laughs> yeah. And, and he was able to easily defeat her because he is an ancient planeswalker. Like, he is centuries old. So he's been at it a while. I mean, oh, yeah. I, mean I, I, I know a little bit about him, and yeah, he 
literally created angels. So, uh, so literally, besides Liliana, he's the one I want to talk about the most because he's got a—he's just a cool character. Oh, I—you've told me a bit about him, and dang, I am—I am down. So, uh, but let's get over with Liliana, then that? we can move on to him. Part of a, a fact with, or I guess a fun fact with this whole first section where it talked about how she feared her brother's fate. Her whole point of a lot of her story is trying not to end up like her brother. Like she fears death because of what happened to her brother, and fear fears that she'll end up doing this, turning the same way. Oh, I mean, uh, arguably, it is. Uh, it is not. It, it, it's the exact opposite of <laughs> death that turned him in. It was you trying to prevent. Yeah. So but- you're literally running full straight into the thing. <laughs> well, now she's got a master to make sure she doesn't do it again. Fair, fair. But she's afraid of that death aspect, and that's literally what leads her into her, almost her entire story. Uh, I mean, you know, immortality. We all chase it. Yep. Um, at some point after this, she would go to the plane of Arcavios and become a student of Strixhaven University in the Witherbloom College. Strixhaven, you can kind of imagine as a magic version of, ironically, it's a magic version of Hogwarts. Oh, <laughs> to where you, they have instead of a house, they have five different colleges that learn different things. But which generally, that's mostly how they uh, do it in a lot of stuff. Like I remember in Skyrim and that, you got the different colleges, and D and D have the different colleges. So. Yep. And there's very little actually known about her time there the first time around because it wasn't even brought up until a recent set. Oh, man. Makes sense. Uh, sometimes you don't really flesh out characters, especially if you have as many as Magic the Gathering has. There's some characters in the beginning that are going to be like, they're like, yeah, she, I don't know, ended up with vampire, brother turned monster. And that we'll, we'll get to her later, guys, in that. Yo. Okay, uh, so uh, moving on, uh, the great mending. This was a process of healing Dominaria from damage caused by time rifts through sacrifices of multiple planeswalkers. This event would have major consequences for existing planeswalkers, causing them to lose their immortality and godlike powers. Oh, yes, at one point in the story. They were essentially gods, as far as anybody was concerned that wasn't a planeswalker. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I. Because, like I said, you know, they had immortality, so they never died. Their powers were immense. Oof, they've really, uh, really fallen a little bit. <laughs> and had to kind of bring up the mini because it leads into the rest of her story. Because because of losing her, her powers, she goes in search of other stuff to make. To kind of try and regain some of that, which fair, I'd be a little, I'd be a little irritated at losing like godhood, basically. <laughs> right. Had to move that down a little bit. To... Uh oh, wow. There's more to that. Okay. Yeah, that's why I had to move it down. When I figured that out. I'm like, oh crap. Okay. Right. So after the mending, she would meet the ancient dragon planeswalker Nicole Bolas. She was envious that he seemed unaffected by the mending, to where he would actually berate her, saying, I've lost more power than you can learn in a dozen lifetimes. <laughs> oh, wow, that's... Because right. he's already a powerful... Oh, yeah, and just imagining right. how powerful he is now in the story, before current events, and just imagining what he could have been before the mending. <laughs> yeah, this, this guy <laughs> oh, even kind of... If I remember correctly, he even predates, like, Soren. Like, he is that old. <laughs> I, I hate it. I I hate Nicole already when I'm playing against it. I'm not happy to hear about this. Um, he would be the one that explains to Liliana about how they lost their power. Um, he would broker a deal between her and four demon lords um, who would give Liliana her youth and a fraction of her power back in exchange for her service. This contract would end up actually be tattooed into her skin. Damn, that talk about talk about binding contract. Right. That's one way to do it. <laughs> okay, uh, Liliana would eventually find her way to Ravnica, yeah, uh, where she resided for some time. 
During that time, she would often be a freelancer or a freelance for hire for another planeswalker named uh, Tazeret. She would also meet Jace Bellerin, a mind mage planeswalker. She would go as far as seducing and having an affair with Jace. She would ultimately betray Jace and po- po- poison? Position. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Jace and uh, yeah, position him to fight uh, Tazeret. Oh man, already not getting off to a great start in that relationship. No, and there was definitely a lot more in that whole story, but again, yeah, having gotta, to cut down, gotta pick what we're putting in this. Uh, in and this and episode. that was very much the overall arc. Is yeah, she had a she had a very long or she had a somewhat long relationship with Jace during her time here, but yeah, she kind of screwed him over by. Turn, trying to turn him against Tezzeret and uh, yeah. she had other plans for Tezzeret. I could legit, uh, wow. Especially from what I recall in that, don't they have an ongoing history, her and Jace? Oh, yeah. It comes up a lot. Actually, it comes up much later in the story as well. So one of her first demon lords, again, no idea how to pronounce this name, uh, Kothfed? Kothofed? I don't know. Kothafed? Uh, yeah. I always call him just Kothafed. Um, yeah. He would give Liliana the task to search for an ancient powerful relic known as the Chain Veil from an ancient ogre civilization, the Anaki, um, on the plain of Chandelar, which apparently she had at least visited it before. Okay. So she at least already knew where she was going somewhat. Has an idea. That's, yeah. that's always good. Um, on her way to the Veil's location, she would be assaulted by a beast and she would sl- uh, slay it. Unknowingly pissing off Garrick Wildspeaker, another planeswalker. Ah, um, Garrick. A lot. <laughs> Garrick attacked her in the temple after she had located the veil and tracked her through a hidden tunnel or through the hidden tunnels until he was defeated by the veil enhanced Liliana. Yeah, that veil's nothing to joke with, huh? And during that time, it was a very brief fight, but she, uh, it was during this one that she would actually curse him. So he'd get that whole thing he's got going. Yep. And that, Which yep. we'll go more into depth if we ever do a video on him. Sounds good. Uh, after she learned the amount of power she gained from using the veil, she would travel back to... Uh, uh Sanctuary and confront him. Liliana would use the veil to destroy the first demon. Whoa. She collapsed afterwards in pain as her tattoos given by Codafed began to bleed. Um, the more I say it, it's starting to sound like a um, like a medical thing you take for right. hangovers. Get Codafed and, and banish <laughs> that hangover. <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, dang, killing a demon, which... Uh, for those of you who haven't aren't big on like anything in the magic or D and D world, demons are nothing to scoff at. Like, well, especially these ones, because like before that her deal were brokered with, they're like demon lords, like they're the top. Yeah, like they are powerful. They are not just possessing old men, like old women, and little children in this world. Now these are giant horn things that will rip your head off. And that, so yeah, no, impressive, impressive. Well, uh, what else we got? So, to her second trip to Innistrad, ah. after killing Kothafed, um, she would travel back to hunt her next demon, Grizzlebrand. Unfortunately, he had gone missing during a duel with the Archangel Avacyn. While she now had to hunt for the demon, she would learn Garrick had hunted her to Innistrad, um, where he would attack her. She would raise a swarm of ghouls, and while not being enough to defeat him, it was enough to get her away. Mm, um, gotta work your way up sometimes. There's right. tears to this demon thing. And well, no, that was to get away from Garrick. Oh, to get away from Garrick. Because he, he would track her down and attack her on Innistrad. So he Ooh, she would raise the ghouls yeah. at least enough to get herself away from him. Yeah, he becomes a big problem at some point, doesn't well, he? he? Uh, kind of. I mean to be honest, I don't know much of his story right now, but I know him and Jace have a thing where Jace kinda helps cure him. We might have to do an episode on... Uh, we're going to have to do more episodes on these characters. Oh, definitely. yeah. Uh, but continuing. Um, she would learn that an official of the Church of Avacyn, Micaeus the Lunarch, had been killed and was her best chance to find Grizzlebrand. So she would retrieve and resurrect the corpse of the dead Lunarch. 
and her machinations will bear fruit as would she would learn of the hell vault from Micaeus. Knowing she couldn't destroy the vault herself after she wove a spell around the vault, and then she would force Thalia, Th- um, Thalia. Thalia uh, to choose either let the spell destroy the vault or save her men. As predicted, Thalia would choose her man. Uh, I want to call it Talia. Maybe that's the correct. Anyway. And, but, you know, who knows? That may be correct. I'm going with Talia now. <laughs> if it sounds right. It sounds right to me. Uh, Talia would choose her man because, you know, F reality. Uh, with the H- Hellvault destroyed the Grizzle brand and Avacyn freed, Liliana would trace down the demon. Uh, track. What? Tr- would track down the demon. Oh, would. Track down the demon. Yeah, Lilian would track down the demon, uh, slaughtering slaughtering demons and angels alike. Dang! Until she cornered him and used the chain veil to kill him. After he tried to promise her power in exchange for not killing him, like give me more power. <sighs> Clearly, I got more than you, buddy. Right. And you know the whole reason she's even hunting him. She doesn't want to leave him alive. <laughs> How I mentioned that she slaughtered demons and angels alike. Kind of a fun fact. I don't remember where she got it exactly or when, but her crown she wears is actually a crown from an angel she has killed. That little gold, weird-looking crown she wears in her cards and stuff. Dang! Yeah, that's from an angel. Oh, that's some a- that's some Amazon warrior shit right there, bro. Right. Like, de- like. Like you wear you wear the mantle of this person as for pride as a warning, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so after killing Grizzlebrand, she would again return to Chandelar for answers about the Chain Veil, finding out it housed the spirits of the entire Anunnaki civilization. Refusing to change her remaining demon masters for a million more, she would try to leave it on the plane with no effect, as her body would refuse to let go, and even she would raise a skeleton to try and walk it to the altar but the skeleton would not move like it, it would not turn away from her to where huh. after she, she tried to leave the skeleton would follow her and she would even try to end the spell um releasing the skeleton but the skeleton would literally jump at her to put the veil back on her arm it's like she was stuck with this veil oh and she That's... eventually gives up and planes walks away because at that point she realized she's kind of not getting away from it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's it's not great. That's uh, definitely some sci- bad signs at the at the get go. It's like, right. okay, I'm done with you. I'm gonna put you back. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's not normal. That's not good. <laughs> okay, um, she uh, okay, she would make a brief stop back to Ravnica uh, to try and convince him uh, or convince her former lover Jace to help her deal with her final demons, which he would not do as he would leave to help another planeswalker, Gideon Gural uh, Jura. or Jura, Gideon Jura. Who began? Uh, who begged for Jace's help with Eldrazi on the plane Zendikar, and the uh, so kind of an explanation Zendikar. of what okay. Eldrazi are now. Oh yes, yes. The Eldrazi are a race of being who feed off the mana of planes until their destruction. There are three titans, and they are all horrifying. Yeah, so yeah, with the Eldrazi, you have the three main titans. They live in between the planes. It's called the Blind Eternities. And as I did research to try and at least do this small explanation, apparently the most you see on the plane when they arrive is a small fraction of them. So you don't even see the full aspect of these titans. That's horrifying. It is. They're already so massive. Yeah, just imagine the rest of them now. (laughs) But yeah, so... As they are awoken for one reason or another, they they will feed on planes of existence until they are gone. Okay, well. So, yeah. And then that whole thing on Zendikar, we will definitely go over with characters who are actually there. Okay. As she was not, she went back to Innistrad again. Okay, sounds good. That's uh, for the future. Um, she would then return to her state on Innistrad and would start to... Con- 
conduct experiments on the chain veil, trying to remove its curse. Um, she would actually end up seeing Jace again, as he would briefly uh, talk with her, trying to find Soren Markov. Hmm. Because, again, that's something we'll have to go over a little bit more in another story. But he ends up trying to follow clues, and it leads to a really messed up Soren Markov manner. It's all twisted, and reality is bending. And after dealing with two Eldrazi, he's on the hunt, assumingly, for a third. Okay, fair. That's a... Uh, probably should just make sure they're all gone with... Ugh. Right. The Eldrazi, uh, the Eldrazi tied in... Uh, Emrakul. Emrakul would later arrive on Innistrad instead of abandoning Innistrad as a lost cause. She considered her feelings for Jace, or as she would refer to him as uh, <laughs> this cute cloak boy, telling herself it wasn't that she needed cloak boy, but that she would uh, she needed people to need her, so that she would have some. Uh, protection against her demon enemies. Mm, keep lying to yourself. You're in love. Yeah. And I think part of it is that she just wanted people to need her. Yeah, no. I, I, I That's a nice feel in that, but yeah. like the most roundabout way to get there oh, like, yeah. on her part. <laughs> uh, at this point in her story, she still hasn't quite realized that and that she's not a horrible actual person. True, she's just made some mistakes. We all we all make mis- we all make mistakes, you ancient goddess. We got you. you <laughs> yeah, okay. she she was definitely in the stories, kind of known for giving people. Well, actually, I can't really even say that. She's only given real nicknames to Jace and Gideon. <laughs> but yeah, the whole cloak boy thing is because in that set he showed up wearing like a gray duster that oh. had a cloak on it. But hence okay. the cloak boy. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I've always seen him with kind of, like, cloaks and, like, the robe stuff, so. Like, usually he's always wearing, like, just his normal blue robes, but, yeah, this time he was wearing, like, a legit, like, brown-gray duster, like a like a cowboy. <laughs> oh, dang. That's awesome. That's, I need to find a picture of that sometime. Um, I'll find it for you. <laughs> hell, yeah. Um, after this, later on, Lili- uh, Liliana would raise a zombie army to fight the Eldrazi overrunning the plane. Uh, when... Liliana arrived on Thraben, uh, where the concentration of Eldrazi horrors was highest. Her reception by the Gatewatch, which was a group of planeswalkers who swore to protect the multiverse. So essentially, it's like an Avengers for the multiverse. Uh, um, like uh, like uh, the Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, you can do that one too. Yeah, I figured more people would know who the. Avengers oh no, no, are. To- totally <laughs> that. But I'm like, I'm like, I think there are actual teams for this. <laughs> Kind of. There are, there's a there's, few, there's, but they're not well known. The multiverse. There's the time, time, uh, timeline. Yeah, it's which creates multiverse. Almost like the time police, though. Yeah, like to create stop branches. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so her reception by the Gatewatch would be poor, as Nissa, an elf planeswalker, having felt the dark magic radiating from the chain veil. So, you know, they, they sense this <sighs> evil that she is carrying with her. They're like, mm, I don't trust you. I mean, fair not to trust in that, but, uh, you know, maybe give it a chance. You travel the multiverse on that. I'm sure you've seen worse. Maybe. Well, hopefully. They are fighting Eldrazi, so they have definitely seen worse. Oh, yeah. Right there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, confronted directly with the Eldrazi Titan, uh, Liliana would use more power from the Chain Veil than ever before feeling close to the power she had wielded before the mending while that power protected her against emrakul and allowed her to attack the titan directly it would uh it also took a great toll on her body leaving her near death later she awoke emrakul had been sealed in Istrad's moon by the gatewatch and tamio and uh, her wounds would be had been healed by the other planeswalkers. Seeing that a group of allies could be useful for her longtime plans, she decided to join the Gatewatch, and albeit with the intention of directing them to her own pl- plans. Which, I mean, isn't that how every like kind of jerk character starts out? Like, yeah, oh, I'll yeah. Jo- I'll join your group. I'm gonna get them to 
do what I want. Then eventually she's sac- they're sacrificing themselves for a group. Right. Or something. And it's like, what happened to your plans? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So proceed. So very briefly, we'll go over this more in someone else's story that kind of had a little more to do with it. Um, but Liliana and the Gatewatch would travel to the plain of Kaladesh and they would confront Tezzeret once again. So, mm. I know she was a part of it. There was definitely more of a story, I believe, Chandra and the other group or members had a little more going on with it. Okay, more it was Chandra's home plane. More of she was just involved, but she wasn't really a key factor or, exactly. or character. Yeah, she was there, but kind of in the back. Okay, fair, fair. So yeah, that one we'll go over some other time. Yeah, I'm going to let you do this one. <laughs> So, after this, they would travel to a plane, Amunket, um, which is a plane with similarities to ancient Egypt in aesthetic. So, that way everybody kind of has an idea of what it looks like. Um, upon arrival, they were attacked by zombies, which Liliana would gain control over until she was swallowed by a worm. Duh. And worms in the magic universe are essentially just really large, wingless dragons. Yep. I, uh, that is, uh, it's a weird thing to get over. Right. <laughs> like, that's a worm in that, like, I don't, uh, what? but some of them, they legit make look like worms. So. Like, most of them look like just really massive worms. Yeah. And then they're like, you know, that's uh that's like basically a lower class of dragon. I'm like, yep. So. Can we call it, we what was snakes taken? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because there actually are snakes. I mean, yeah, but still, you get why it's, it's a little confusing. I mean, I hope people get why I'm confused. So, after being swallowed, initially, the Gatewatch assumed she was dead. Until she would use the chain veil to decompose the worm from the inside. Oh, dang. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you see the zombie worm just decomposing more. Until she just kind of walks out. <laughs> Just sw- just swiping stuff off of her like like that was unnecessary and annoying. I feel like that's exactly what happened. It's been a mi- been a while since I've read that story, but because that was the first real magic story I read. But yeah, that was essentially what it was. <laughs> um, after that, they would make it to the main city, which I erased his name because I am not attempting to pronounce it. Um, okay, but here they'd be greeted greeted by the natives. And Lily Hunter was delighted when she noticed mummified servants. <sighs> she <And> would be. <laughs> I can't blame her, you know. A master of necromancy, and here is a plane using what you do as slaves, essentially. I mean, slaves mm. involves the thing to have a soul or a conscience or a higher plane of thought. Not necessarily. I mean, that's why I'm going on. It makes that's, me feel made, better. That's how we determine it to make you make us feel bad about it. I mean, that's why I'm just going to keep going on. And that, I mean, it's a zombie. It's, it's, ba- it's basically if you built a machine to do your stuff. Except you know, you're using somebody's body. But they're they're long gone. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what? Let me put this all down. Okay. While the rest of the gate watch was underway to learn more about Bolus and the plane, Liliana instead used shades. Which are kind of a form of spirit. Okay. I was just picturing her putting on some sick glasses. Like, <laughs> like yo, get my shades. Uh, shades, which are spirits. Uh, to spy, using the time to retreat and think about how to direct the Gatewatch against uh, Razaketh. Razaketh. I'll come up with something for that. But uh, her third demon, uh, Razaketh was her third demon. Liliana and Jace would later follow a shade servant of hers to a place inscribed with Razaketh's symbol. Liliana and Jace witnessed the creation process of the unin- anointed. anointed out of those who had died, uh, died in combat. As well as a mural that implied Razaketh's involvement in the afterlife. Learning of her motivations with the demon, Jace accused her of betraying their trust. That's, that's like getting upset at uh, having a rogue in your party. And right. it's, like, it's like, you stole from the people we were helping? 
I don't know what you guys want from me. Right. Honestly. Like, I don't know what you were expecting. You, like, especially for Jay's. Like, he knew she'd been hunting her demons. What What else did you expect? Yeah. Like, also, is she if she finds out demons on the plane you guys just went to, are you, like, I feel like she's one of those characters in the group that she's like, hey, Jace, I need you to come with me real quick to help me out with something. What do you think it's going to be with? What's the one thing this person's been doing the whole time? Right. Like, that's on you, Jace. I, I, as much as you are right, she didn't betray your guys' trust, you shouldn't have really had that trust. Oh, yeah, no. And kind of real quick to go over what the anointed is, is this plane, they trained their warriors, and they went through all these trials, and they become you know these elite fighters. And it was an honor for them to die because then they would become anointed and become these mummified warriors. Oh. So they're still serving after death as, as fighters. Which comes up a little bit later in a later section, okay, as what they're used for later on. Okay, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say, damn, you don't even get a break when you die in this world. Nope, not in that one, at least. <laughs> and my soul and mind better be gone if they reanimate me in that. I'm, I'm tired of working. Right. Um. <laughs> so on, on Amiket, they have two sons, and after the second son had come to rest between the monu- uh the horns in the Bullis Monument. The gate to the afterlife opened. Razaketh stood revealed to the population of the city, which apparently he had never been seen before, just kind of on the murals. Mm. Um, okay. The demon would utter a challenge to Liliana. Razaketh would take control of her body, calling her towards him using a hidden clause in their contract. Uh, gotta watch out for the fine print. Right. He would then toy with her until he was intercepted by the gate watch, who surprised him enough for Liliana to free herself. She would use her magic to take control over the dead be- uh, beasts in the Luxa, which is a river. In this, and it's kind of a Nile-like river in this uh, set. Okay. Um, she would tear him apart and leave to be feasted upon by the undead uh, beasts. So, like, these undead alligators just <laughs> fed on this demon. <laughs> and apparently, from what I remember of reading the book, it was pretty huh. Brutal. I was gonna say that sounds that sounds metal as heck, bro. Like, some of the Gatewatch even kind of uh, questioned her on that one. They're like, <laughs> did that really need to happen? Yeah. Did you no. need to go to that extreme? You probably not, but it was. <laughs> it's one of those. She turns like probably not, but it was pretty wicked, right? <laughs> like that was metal. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Gatewatch discovered that Bolas had been creating an army of Eternals. Oh, my God. Which is where the anointed come into play. Okay. Highly trained fighting specialists, which had been zombified while keeping their skills intact. When they confronted the dragon, they were soundly defeated. Liliana betrayed her friends and fled to another plane. Yeah, they, they got whooped on by the dragon yeah straight I mean, up like from what i remember the story like they were, they had no chance they they were done god to think his power before the mending yeah it kind of terrifies me that's <laughs> horrifying like oh <laughs> so um liliana would planeswalk back to her home you know just kind of out of instinct as she fled Mm, fair. Um, she would soon be reunited with the rest of the Gate Watch. Confronted by an angry Nyssa and a hurt Chandra, she would try to defend her position, arguing that she would not be used against Bolas while she was still in contract with her demon masters. Which, I mean, kind of makes sense. It's yeah, it's logical because you know she's not really on her own free will anymore while still under their control. That could and that could easily affect her in the fight. And with Ballas, you bet you better come correct, son. Exactly, and that's like, and that's why she tried to defend herself. I mean, obviously, that's not her entire reasons <laughs> for doing it. Oh no, 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 no! But the only defense she has, right? But. She would also, during this, reveal that her last demon lord, Belzenlock, was also on Dominaria, where she would try to convince the rest of the Gatewatch to help her to destroy him. Only Gideon would choose to remain with her, as all the others would go off on their own reasons. Like, Nyssa was <sighs> left because she was pissed. Mm, Chandra sense. left to get stronger herself because of Nicole. Yep. And, uh, Gerald... God, he's one lord. He's Gerald. one lord. Our... Gideon? Gideon. Gideon. <laughs> This is not the Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> Gideon, he he is one loyal sob man. He is uh, 
he's a sol- he's a solid bro to have on the team. Oh yeah, and that he's also he definitely feels like that one who'd be like, ah, I get what you did. I'll help you. And everybody's like, seriously, seriously. He's like, gentlemen, she's had a rough life, and we I think we've all had rough lives ourselves. Definite palate. I mean, he definitely was, especially because at this point he was growing fond of her for other reasons. Like he was seeing what kind of person she was becoming, and not uh-huh. necessarily that. She wasn't as horrible as the others may have portrayed her to be, or even as she tried to portray herself to be. Which makes sense. It's kind of that's that's a sweet story. I like it, that. It's kind of where Jace is, but Jace and her have that kind of jaded history of her trying to, you know, seduce <laughs> and use them. <laughs> True, that is a little hard to get past. So it was a little easier for Gideon to kind of overlook her past because he didn't have that history with her. Fair. Okay, so. Uh, Trying to heal Gideon after their defeat by Bolas, they enter the ruined settlement of uh, Vess. Uh, learning that the Cabal, a black mana-aligned organization, had come to her homeland and turned the forest into a marshland, she also received news that her family's fate had become a legend and none of her relatives survived. Ooh. When she went to gather her um, when she went to gather herbs to heal Gideon she discovered that the manor still stood when she returned uh, (laughs) Vess was attacked by the cabal Uh, using her magic she would take control over one of the zombies learning that their master was none other than her brother Josu I go with Josu Josu that's kind of what the common name seems to be in the community. Let's go with Jasu. Uh, okay, so Jasu, who had been transformed into a lich by Bells... Bells and Lock. Bells and Lock. Uh, Cultus. Liliana realized that Bells and Lock had used her brother to divert her strength, knowing that if she used the Chain Veil to destroy Jasu, she would be too weak to use the artifact against him. Telling this to Gideon she, what, uh, that she had learned this, she expected him also to abandon her like the rest of the gay watch. Instead, like the man Gideon is, Aww. he agrees to help her uh, lay her brother to rest. Liliana would end up eventually defeating her brother, as he did. Um, he cursed her, telling her the fate of their family, and it was her dark magic that brought them so low. Because, <sighs> you know, even though he was a lich and kind of undead, he still apparently had at least enough of his memories to screw with her yeah and you know it's one of those i want to be like dick move bro but i'm like lily kind of was a dick move to the family yeah i i'm like i'm like hearing that i'm just like fair fair i mean fair (laughs) that's the that's the least jab he can get in in that considering (laughs) oh man that's that's bad though okay uh Lily, oh man, wow, this is a longer story. In our- yeah, the, the last couple stories had a little more to them in depth, okay. and especially for her because she took a lot more, she was a lot more in place of in the stories, and it was a little more revolved around her. Makes sense. Uh, so Liliana and Gideon would learn learn of a powerful sword named Black Blade and realized this soul drinker... <laughs> could be a weapon in their fight against Bolas. They would use this sword to kill her final demon. With the demon defeated, the member of the Gatewatch would leave to Ravnica to plan for the ultimate fight. And Black Blade. That's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a really, really badass artifact. That, like, it legit, it fed on souls. Hence that soul drinker part. That's awesome. I like so it. So that's what made one so effective against her last her demon lord uh, Bells and Lock. And you know, it, why not think it might be good against the dragon? I mean, at that point, you throw anything you can at him because like, clearly their magic ain't strong enough. So they gotta find what help they can. Yeah. So yeah, don't take every advantage you can with that dude. Yep. Okay. Um, and so, as the Gatewatch would leave for Ravnica, she intent- Liliana would intend to follow her friends, but found that she was unable to. Nicole Bolas would then appear, pointing out that with all four of her demons dead, her contract had devol- defaulted to its original broker, Bolas himself. 
He also explained that if she disobeyed his orders in any way, the pact would kill her. She would age hundreds of years in a moment. So, being kind of a prisoner to a new master, she would follow Bolas off the plane. Oh. So, not realizing what she was doing. Dang. She just put herself in underneath a stronger master now. That unlike her demons, you know, yeah, not like, so easy to get rid of. Oh, Nicole, no, but no, why would you, you jerk? Well, if we ever go over a story of Nicole, he's very Palpatine like, where he had very long term plans that affected almost a lot of almost all of the magic stories at some point. Okay, well, that dang, that's insane. Okay, so uh, War of the Spark. Which, kind of do a quick um, background to that and why it's called that is Nicole, he had built this plan and he found a spell that he could use to siphon the sparks of other planeswalkers and get trying to make himself a god again. Yeah. Uh, um, and a lot of sets leading up, including the one that we briefly talked about, Kaladesh, he would get an artifact... A couple artifacts from there, a couple art or an artifact from another pl- um, set that we didn't even talk about because it has nothing to do with her. It's all Jace. Um, but it was she on that plane. He got a artifact called the Immortal Sun that stops planeswalkers from being able to planeswalk away, and it kind of acted as a beacon for them to come to. Oh, oh! So dang. he would start this beacon, attracting all these planeswalkers to Ravnica, so he can go through with his plan. And because of the Immortal Sun, they couldn't get away. So they were kind of stuck. And so that's why it became known as the War of the Spark. As you know. Trying uh, to keep their sparks. Exactly. I, was like, I don't know if that's actually what it was ever called in the actual universe, but that's what the set was called. And it's kind of why. That makes sense. Okay. So um, on Ravnica, Bolas had made Liliana and uh, Je- uh, uh On Ravnica... Bolas had made Liliana the general of the Dead Horde, the undead Eternals from the Ame- from a Mon- Monquette, a Monquette uh, which are now embalmed in uh, L- Lazotep. Mm. What the hell? Laz- okay. Lazotep. I have Lazotep. no idea how to pronounce that one either. Lazotep. Come and come down and buy you some. It'll preserve. It'll preserve and ta- and tape up that hole. Uh, a valuable blue mineral that preserves their life force. During the battle of the plane, she would follow Bolus Bolus's commands, but would at the same time try to prevent as much damage she could without directly defying him. Specifically, keeping the Eternals from entering any buildings. No, I mean, you, it, it may be small, yeah. but it's something. It's and, and it gave people a chance if they could get into a building. For the most part, at that point, they were safe. Yeah, because unless something happened to the building itself, which I mean, you know, happens. Yeah, it's war. But she did. She she tried to somewhat make up for the fact that she was stuck with Bolus. And yeah. tried to minimize what she was doing. It's uh, and a little bit counts when you're dealing with that with that god. Oh dragon. yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Later on in the battle, after Gideon failed to slay the dragon with the black blade, which completely shattered on this dragon's head, like it, it had no chance. And Bolas, oh. Bolas knew that from the beginning, <laughs> and it's kind of why he let them think that it would help him. Fair. I mean, why, why, why tell them that it's not going to work and let them go find something that might? Right. Just let them like, oh no, this is going to be great in <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yep. Um, but after that, Bolus would command Liliana to use two God Eternals. So he turned a couple of the gods from Mom and Cat into Eternal Zombies. Um, Damn. He would he, command her to use God Eternals Oketra and Bantu to crush the enemy forces. It was at this time she finally felt regret no longer wanted to be a slave to Bolas. She would no longer, fearing death, break her contract and turn the internal army on Bolas himself. However, in doing so, she started to dissolve, but she continued to push the army. Gideon would pass on his invulnerability to Liliana, allowing her to survive while sacrificing himself to her contract. 
I remember when uh, this set came out, and they came yeah. out with that uh, cinem- cinematic trailer for it. That was still my favorite wow. trailer ever. That scene is just so powerful when you see the tattoos light up on her and everything. Yep. Like, and I love oh. and I love that video too because it really kind of, especially with the music, because I don't remember exactly what the name of the song was, but the the music, the scene, it really shows how she had realized that. She was done being the pawn. Yep. Whether it meant she was gonna die or not, she was she was turning. It was a very powerful and well done like cinematic trailer for that whole thing. It was. I love it. Liliana would command the God Eternals to attack Bolas. During that struggle, Bolas would be impaled by a spear through the back by Niv Mazet, a dragon from Revnica. Bolas managed to destroy Oketra. But Bantu would uh, was able to bite the <laughs> bite the new dragon god and extract the sparks Bolas collected, including his own. Bantu would quickly rapture into shards because he wasn't able to contain all of the sparks. That's a lot of power. Rupture. Uh, rupture. Not, not rapture. Rupture. Oh. <laughs> Bantu would quickly rupture into into shards because he wasn't able to contain all the sparks. I mean, that's a lot of power. I also think rapture and rupture. I think it was a not a very close synonym, like right. like like definitely reaching on that synonym part. But it was a yeah. A thesaurus would be proud. Yeah, Sorry. doing that. It kind of, because that was the thing with the Eternals, they had this a power because of the spell Nicole was using that when they kill, when they attacked a Planeswalker, if they dealt damage to him, they took their spark. Oh. So, Bantu, this dragon, or this god, is taking enough of all the sparks that at this point, which is a very large number of Planeswalker sparks that Nicole had collected, and in the process took Nicole's as well. Oh, that is so much power. Which, and again, most likely going to be going over in someone else's story. We'll go over the actual fate of Nicole. Okay. As far as the plane is concerned, he is dead. Ah. As far as most people, actually, as far as the majority of people in the universe, Nicole is dead. But, of course, in, as in many stories, nothing ever truly stays dead. And this one isn't actually on Nicole's part either. Oh, wow. He didn't uh, keep himself alive. Oh, so this ain't entirely Palpatine. <laughs> no. A little, a little different. That, that did happen with him early on in his story, yes. But not this time. This is not a Palpatine moment. <laughs> hey, can I, borrow, can I look at your homework? And that just change up so they don't know. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, before this part comes up, kind of a, a quick note that I also didn't put in there. At one point during the battle, Jace and a couple other planeswalkers would be sent to attempt to kill Liliana oh. to kind of stop the fighting. Cause they figured if she was no longer in control, it'd be easier to deal with her zombies. Yeah. Which in theory would be because they don't have this massive necromancy planeswalker controlling him nope but in the in that regard though arguably having her at the helm is better than if uh nicole was straight oh, yeah. up telling them what to do because yeah then the, the houses wouldn't have been a safe place oh yeah no he would have just been wipe it all out why why was she not wiping it all out i <laughs> yep and you know jace being jace and still having some feelings for her, he oh, actually course. would attempt to instead of going first for the kill he would attempt to read her mind and figure out why she's doing this, but Nicole had blocked off her mind to him. So he wasn't able to. So that's, they all day continued to attempt to kill her, which Nicole again thwarted, but. Yeah. Um, but after the battle, she was distraught and heartbroken over Gideon's death. Jace would try to comfort her and warn her that she needed to leave quickly as staying in Ravnica was dangerous. Um, she would pick up the spirit gem of Bolas, which was what floated in between his horns. Um, and as soon as she could, she plans walked away. That's a big gem. Right. Like, which apparently actually isn't because like they're holding in their hands. Oh, okay. Like, it's yeah. not as big as it looks. Sorry. As big as, <laughs> as big as Nicole is in that, you I just, assume I just imagine a, it's a human sized gem. You would assume. Yeah. Like I imagine her picking up basically, yeah, this punching bag sized gem. And right. Just, like, 
kind of just like, I got to maneuver it. Like, <laughs> like, like Jace, are you just going to watch me? Like, can you give yes. me a little help? <laughs> Jace, give help. No. <laughs> he, was, he was not a strong person. <laughs> <laughs> ah, true. Yeah. He's a lot, lot more book learned. <laughs> okay. Uh, is that it for that part? Uh, yep. Uh, Okay, uh, the planeswalker, Kaya, 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 Kaya. Go, let's go with Kaya. Just reading wise, it's gonna be easier for me. <laughs> uh, the planeswalker Kaya was tasked by the guild masters of Ravnica and Niv Mezet to hunt down Liliana, as they collectively decided that she defected too late and was directly responsible for most of the casualties. Kea would be accompanied by another planeswalker, Teo. Which in the story, she has another name, but she is bet more known as Rat, even in that story. You know, I like it. It's simple. It's straightforward. Which, that character had a very interesting thing about her. If you weren't looking at her, you forgot about her. What? Yeah. <laughs> Oh. And it got kind of heartbroken, heartbreaking as you read the story and you learned that even her parents, without re- like having to f- really focus and force their thought on her, forgot her. Aww. So it's a, little, it's a cool power, but it gets a little heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. Like, aw, that's, that's sad. Okay. So once again, instinctively, she would flee back to her home in Caligo. <laughs> <laughs> um, feeling remorseful for everything she had done in general, and especially to Jason Gideon, she almost let go, nearly drowning at one point. Dang! Um, but a fleeting white figure kept her going. Yeah, you know it's bad when the necromancer who's afraid of death is, uh, is willing to pretty much just let herself die. Yeah, wow, that got depressing <laughs> real quick. <laughs> yeah, the, kind of, the end of her story kind of did. Like, dang, wow, okay, <laughs> proceed. Um, Liliana would find that her old estate had been restored to its original splendor. A nearby servant, enslaved with a gold collar around her neck, warned Liliana not to proceed further or risk being captured by the mistress of the house, Liliana Vess. Seeking to uncover the mystery of her imposter, Liliana entered the mansion to confront Mistress Vess, but was subdued, and a gold collar was placed around her neck. Oof. Okay, it's uh, getting interesting now. Uh, Liliana was found by uh, her would-be assassins working in a nearby garden. And in a trance, as Teo attempted to remove the collar from Liliana's neck, she was jolted back to her senses. Liliana fought Teo and Kaya and was uh, prepared to kill them but was knocked unconscious by the rats. Uh, Liliana awoke and agreed to let Kao kill her in exchange for defeating the imposter and freeing her people. Her imposter gained her powers from a blue sapphire that contained a very powerful djinn, which allowed her to contract the estates, uh, state workers and conjure illusions. Liliana uh, revealed to Kea, Teo, and Rat that she had uh, tried it, sometimes unsuccessfully, to minimize Bolus's carnage on Ravnica. They, you know, after some serious um, discussion and a lot of convincing by Teo and Rat, um, Kea would let, decide to let Liliana live, although proof of a kill would still be needed, you know, for the guild masters and Niv Mizzet to let that let her go. Yeah, uh, you know, assuming she's dead. Um, Teo would suggest that Lily give up the veil, but Liliana struggled with the decision while holding it, uh, holding the spirit gem in one hand and the chain veil in the other. The spirit gem began to glow as, and as it disappeared, Liliana dropped the veil and gave it up. So apparently something about this gem kind of overrode the curse and was able to let her let it go. Huh? Wow. That's, that's new. Which then Teo would use his magic. It was very. It was a sh- white shield like magic. Yeah. Um, he would use it to encase the chain veil as they transported it back to Ravnica. Smart, smart. Don't touch. Don't touch <laughs> it. Don't touch that thing. I, learned- I want to say Liliana had uh, warned them about that uh, when, when they're like, "Here, ha- we need to take that because they know you will never give that up without being dead." Yeah, probably a good thing to warn them about. <laughs> So, uh, before returning to Ravnica, Ko and Teo and Rat promised to meet Liliana on uh, Fiora 
on Fiora, uh, Liliana would create a new name for herself. Anna Laura. Oh, no, that nope. sounds sweet. What? Eora. Eora. Oh, that's an yeah, I. Yeah, that's an I. Okay, Anna Eora. That's still cute. That's still sweet. Anna was for her former mentor, but she had no idea where Eora, Eora had come from. It had just popped into her head. Yora comes from Gideon's real name. Aw. So, yeah. And understandably, it popping in her head, she had no idea what Gideon's real original name was. Yeah, no. Nice. Well, yeah, Fair. that, that and it's not confirmed that that's where it came from, but as the fan base of Magic, that's pretty consistent. And it makes sense also because, you know, Anna being from her mentor, yep. Yora being from Gideon, who sacrifice himself to keep her alive it would it would track and during her time on her very brief time on fiora that we have known about so far she contemplated very heavily on why gideon would do that for her of all people because you know she didn't believe she was deserving of that sacrifice you don't get pick who you love (laughs) nope uh okay uh Uh, for the last little section finally (laughs) Um, she would, at some point after this, there's still a lot of confusion exactly of when this happened. Um, but she would head back to the plane of Arcavios to go back to Strixhaven, uh, an attempt to way to find, or an attempt to find a way to bring Gideon back, um, in the biblioplex at the school, which is essentially their giant ass, um, library. Okay. Which, from Damn. what I remember of the kind of story behind that is, I guess it has like, magic from all over the multiverse like this is a not just a magic school but a lot of planeswalkers come to this school oh which oh because that's kind of a cool concept like because one of the other planeswalkers she specifically goes and recruits them to and like invites them to the school so shit because of that there's you know a vast section of learning in this place because it's from all over not just about one plane which kind of makes a lot of sense actually given that right um she would introduce herself as safina i actually don't know because up until i did this section i never knew she had a first name in this <laughs> um set um but okay. uh, introduce herself as safina onyx and become a professor at witherbloom so she went back to her her college and became a professor, which <laughs> makes sense because it was a college based in black and green, so it was based in life and death. Um, she would meet with the, the college founder Bellagos Witherbloom, and he would tell her to honor the deed to honor the dead is to, uh, is reflected in how we treat the living. So he wouldn't give her a way to resurrect Gideon. Because he yeah. said there was no way, which, you know, there's got to be a way somewhere in this vast multiverse. Oh, yeah. But he refused to do it, saying, you know, you got to honor him by the way you treat the living now. Yeah. It's some people, some people are fine with being dead. Some people deserve yeah. that rest. Um, during this set, a group, um, group of mages that used to be students there, they get kind of kicked out. They would start a conflict. Um and after the fight, uh, she would take up an offer from the deans to stay at the school on a condition she would teach introduction to ne- the necromantic arts. <laughs> she would leave behind the false name and become Professor Liliana Vess, Aww. where she'd given up on trying to resurrect Gideon and uh, tried to do his memory justice by acting as a responsible person. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of ador- that's an adorable ending. It really is, and I'm sure eventually we'll see more of her. Yeah, but I I like her becoming a teacher, and I, right. I just I I like how kind of cute and adorable that ending is. That's I I really liked that one. That was heartwarming. And she's definitely always been. She was the first planeswalker I was introduced to when we started playing Magic all those years ago. <laughs> I remember. And, <laughs> and reading her story, it just kind of made me like her even more because it's that. Yes, she did some evil things, but she was trying, in her way, doing it for better reasons because she was trying not to let herself die. So it's yeah. not the worst reasons to do some of these things. True. And and yeah, she had some bad moments. True, but she was portrayed as very human, which is yeah. what she was. 
And like, she definitely has that very, very long um, res- uh, long redemption. So there she had go. a very, very long redemption arc, but she eventually gets there. Yeah, at least she actually gets there. At you least know. she... And she comes to terms with things, which I feel as though that was her problem, was she couldn't come to terms with the bad yeah, things she that happened. Exactly. She couldn't accept it. And once she finally did is when she really started growing as a, as a person and getting away from her being a villain in the mm-hmm. story. Which was happy to see. And you know what? Uh, like, I mean, I know you, like, damn, almost <laughs> every, you, there isn't a, uh, I mean, I legit built a deck based on her and her story. Yeah, essentially. You, you built a deck based on her. You have a map base. You have a map play mat of her. You have like a car. Well, that is your thing. And like, damn, I get why. I I get it. This is an awesome character that I need to read more on. So, and, uh, and you know, and at least now there's a reason besides the fact that they portray her as a very good looking woman. Ah, uh, that don't <laughs> hurt. I mean, shit. I'm I'm a fan now, so. For anyone that's still listening, if you got something out of this, enjoyed the episode, or even liked the character before from a movie, a comic, a cartoon, hell, even that t-shirt that you saw one time, you're a fan too. If you want to jump on this train, why not subscribe and share with a friend? Dick Rail out. Y'all keep riding them rails.